Great, so I'm going to kick off just because I want to give the speakers as much time as possible to speak, but also to hear from um, participants. Uh, this is the TUC Black Members and Class panel on tackling racism at work. We've got an incredible lineup. We've got Marsha de Cova, de Cadova, uh, we've got Sandra Kerr, we've got Asad Rahman, we've got Gloria Mills, um, and we've got Patrick Roach who's going to join us um, via a, a short video and hopefully live later on in the call. Um, just to start by saying just some hashtags if you're going to tweet about the event. Um, the hashtag is TUC, hashtag TUC20. Um, and do at class as well, and we can retweet. So racism at work, I mean, actually class and the Black Members, TUC Black Members panel have been doing joint events at TUC events for some time now. Of course, racism and wanting to tackle racism is not new to, to us, um, but of course the issue has got a lot more attention this year in the wake of the brutal murder of George Floyd at the hands of the US police that then sparked worldwide um, protests and discussions in particular about anti-blackness and the way in which that um, comes up in all sorts of ways, so not just within police and um, the judiciary, although there is a clear problem there, but across all aspects of life, um, whether it be education and in particular what we're going to discuss today, work. Um, it's always seemed to me that whether you look at who's getting jobs, um, whether you're looking at who's being made redundant, whether you're looking at who's on low pay, who's on zero hour contracts, again and again and again over the years, we see the same results, that you are disproportionately more likely to be in precarious work or be out of work if you are black or brown. And um, it's been frustrating for those of us that have worked on this issue for some time. Um, to not have seen that change over time and, and with successive governments. And I think um, one of the things that really struck me and has probably angered me the most in, in the wake of the George Floyd um, murder and protest is that when Boris Johnson and this government came forward and said that they would do yet another review, um, I mean, apart from the people they were hiring to be on there, when people <laughs> like myself were invited to give evidence um, on panels, some of the questions were outrageous. One of the questions um, was, is it helpful to use the term white privilege given uh, the situation um, of the white working class? So we can tell already that this government isn't taking uh, racism seriously, um, even within its work uh, in light of the George Floyd uh, murder, they are still focusing back on culture war issues, let's be clear about that, and the way in which racism has been caught up in that has made it even harder for those of us that speak about racism, and any one of us that tweet about it, talk about it publicly will know that if you talk about racism, you will definitely get racism in return, um, and that is the state of the, of the conversation in this country as it is, um, and many of us would have been extremely alarmed to see counter protests to the Black Lives Matter um, protests and uh, that really, you know, got quite violent. So today we're going to hear from um, five different speakers. We're going to focus in on work, but it will be an opportunity to talk about wider issues and frustrations. We're always keen at class to give space to voices that aren't often heard. Um, and I know that people joining this call today would have been at several of our events in the past where we've spoken about race and class, where we've spoken about frustrations about the use of, say, the term um, white working class when the, when the, uh, the working class is multi-ethnic. And, no, and no obvious was that um, was during the pandemic and just looking at who was on the front line, who was still working, who was still delivering our post, uh, who was still there caring for our elderly relatives, who was there on the front line of the NHS, of transport, um, you could see that very clearly, <laughs> see it also in who was dying. So look, racism um, is a pandemic in itself, and I know, I know that has become a real um, slogan across um, many countries. Um, I'm not going to speak for much longer. Let me let me bring in a video just to start off with from Patrick Roach. From those, for those of you that don't know, Patrick Roach is the I think quite newly um, elected um, teaching unions general secretary, NASUWT, um, 
general secretary and he's also leading on the work um for the tc on um their anti-racism that was just that has just been set up so i'll anyway i'll let him talk about it um but i'm gonna hand over to lester uh who's gonna play that now Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank the TUC and CLASS for organising this fringe meeting and for inviting me to speak. And I'm um, so sorry that I can't be um, uh, present uh, in person, as it were, um, at uh, this uh, particular event. Uh, but uh, I did want to address uh, you all. Uh, and I'm really grateful to the TUC for uh, uh, recording this uh, brief address uh, to you. Um, you know, whilst the TUC uh, Congress um, may have been impacted by a global pandemic, nothing's going to stop our movement from taking the lead in challenging racial injustice in the workplace. This coronavirus pandemic has exposed once again the searing racial injustices at work and also across our country. We, we see it, of course, in terms of low paid and insecure employment, but we also see it in terms of the dangerous work um, that black and Asian workers are doing with greater risk of catching coronavirus and of dying on the job. Uh, and, you know, I represent a teacher trade union, the NASWT, and we see it uh, in terms of what's happening in schools and colleges. We, we see it in terms of the impact, the disproportionate impact of the closure of schools um, that that's had on children and young people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. And we see it in the return, the reopening of schools fully and the failure of schools to actually undertake racial equality um, at risk assessments um, as part of that return uh, to school. And we see it in education from a government that actually says that it's not in the public interest to publish its own racial equality impact assessment of the wider reopening of schools. So, you know, the issues of racial equality and racial injustice, they matter at all levels. They matter within our schools and colleges, they matter in our workplaces, and they matter within our wider society. And as trade unions, it's our responsibility, our responsibility to take, to take the lead, to root out racism and to be unapologetic in calling out racial injustice in the labour market and institutional racism in our workplaces. Because we can't ignore the evidence that there's been a devastating impact of racism and racial equality, which continues to shape, to affect the lives of black workers. And it must be the job of our trade union movement to call out those injustices and to win the case for racial justice to be at the heart of the government's national coronavirus recovery plan. And that's what certainly the NSWT, and I know many other unions, are asking for. And most of all, we need action. We need action to end the injustice of racism, which is stigmatising, which is excluding, suppressing, which is holding back black workers. And to do that, we as a movement have got to organise. We've got to organise against racism in our workplaces. And we must strengthen our alliances across all our members, across our workplaces, our unions, and across our communities. And we must put action for racial justice at the centre of our campaigns and plans as unions and as a movement. Now today, I just want to say a few words about some work that I've been asked to undertake um, on behalf of the TUC. I've been honoured to have been asked to chair the TUC's anti-racism task group uh, over the next 18 months. And it's going to commence its work immediately after TUC Congress. And we'll be setting out shortly how we intend to take forward the work of that task group and how unions, black members, and Trade union members across the board can be involved in that work. For me, that task group mustn't be a talking shop. 
It's got to be a force that makes a difference. It's got to be unapologetic in calling out racial injustice and institutional racism wherever it exists. And we'll be taking forward a wide ranging program of action to tackle racial discrimination and ensure fairness and decent treatment, decent treatment at work. Now, 20 years on from the setting up of the, of the TUC's Stephen Lawrence task group, I would say our movement has come a long way. Despite many who were in denial back then, institutional racism was at least recognized. Unions strengthened their rule book commitments on equality as a requirement of their affiliation to the TUC. And we took the lead um, in identifying um, how our unions were performing, how we were doing on racial justice and equality generally by publishing data and research. And where I come from, it's actions that speak louder than words. Workplace racism still exists. We still have a long way to go, colleagues, to ensure that our movement also reflects the racial diversity of our union memberships. In the wake of the racist murder of Stephen Lawrence, of course, we had a clear purpose to our work. And two decades on, we have a clear and renewed purpose today. What's that purpose? Well, it's campaigning for racial justice. It's uniting against racism. It's advancing racial justice at work and advancing racial justice across society and within our own unions. It's calling out systemic and institutionalized racial inequalities in all sectors of employment. And most of all, it's taking action and using our collective strength to press for real change. We must also learn lessons, colleagues. We must see how far we've come. But most importantly, we as trade unions must renew the commitment to put race, race equality and racial justice at the center of our organizing, our campaigning, our bargaining and our activism. So that we actually do win for black workers. So that we do deliver fairness at work for all. So as I say, I'm sorry that I can't be with you today for this event, but I do look forward as part of the work of the anti-racism task group. I do look forward to meeting with many of you and taking forward this important work in the months ahead. Thank you very much. Great, I think that was a really good introduction to today's discussion. Um, and I'm already seeing questions coming through. So for those of you that want to have think of things or comments or questions, please do put it in the Q&A box um, and I'll draw on those shortly. I want to come to Gloria now, Gloria Mills, and many people on this call know Gloria. She's a long-term anti-racist activist, has worked for the union for many years. Um, at Unison, currently a former TUC president and also um, on the TC Black Members Committee or chairing it, am I right in saying that, Gloria? Yeah, so I'm handing over to Gloria, thank you. Hi, thank you all very much, can you hear me? Can you just put it a bit louder, Gloria? It's a bit quiet. Oh, I'll have to come up, um, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's a bit better, yeah, if you could, yeah, just speak loudly, thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll have to try and speak louder. Okay, well, I first of all have been asked to speak about um, racism at work um, as a public health issue and why black workers should unite to stand up to it. Um, and I want, um, before I go on to that, just to focus on some of the issues um, in relation to racism as a public health issue. I see what the um, coronavirus pandemic has shown the vulnerability of black workers in the workplace, but moreover, um, what we have seen is the potency of racism and how racism um, play out um, in terms of the challenge we are facing in this new century. It's potent because 
um, we see that the president, we see politicians of, of, of the US um, of fan, um, fanning the flames um, of, um, of racism because they know what the power of fear is. They know the power of racial hatred um, because for centuries, um, racial hatred um, has been used for political advantage and for electoral gain. And I must say, you know, the, the racism knows no boundaries and whatever happens in terms of racism does not actually shock me, does not surprise me. It's what you actually expect and what you see if you understand the history of black people's experience um, of racism. Because what racism is about, and in our society, it has been about the systematic and institutional conditioning of people in our society to deny black people's daily experience of racism. When you raise an issue of racism, the first thing people say, where's the evidence? They're not interested in the evidence. That's the whole point about it. Um, they devalue, they deny your experience, they understate your experience, they undervalue your experience, and they undermine um, the evidence of abuse. And more importantly, the evidence of systematic human rights abuse of black people. And I think this is something that we need to recognize. You know, you could bring all the evidence of racism, of being stopped in search of all the um, inequalities that you're facing. And people who are interested in promoting racism for difference, for whatever difference, political advantage, electoral gain, know the potency of it. Know that you poison and you pollute public opinion. And, and that is the, um, that's how you exploit that basic hatred of people based on their color and, and people of difference. So it's powerful, it's poisonous, um, and it pollutes public opinion. And we can see it playing out in so many areas. But one of the good things that we have seen from the George Floyd um, incident and all of the other incidents since the George Floyd incident is that people across the globe are standing up. They recognize it, they're seeing the evidence. They're seeing for themselves this years of evidence, centuries of evidence that has been um, disputed. And they are now saying, no, we will not have this done in our name. So it's really important to see that people across the globe are engaging in this. They're engaging in the issue, um, in the issue of racial disproportionalities and racial disparities, and no more so than in the in, in, employ, uh, in employment and in the workplace. In the workplace, we see coronavirus has um, shown not just um, a light, one of the brightest lights of how racism really plays out in the workplace. Racial bias is prevalent, pervasive, and, and the COVID-19 um, um, corona, um, um, pandemic have shown how profound it is. And what we have seen in a number of areas, it's the systematic exploitation of black workers when it comes to issues of health and safety. We have called this out for years in the trade union movement, but you know, it's not, it's just not on what has been happening. We have seen black workers who have been, um, their concerns have been disregarded. They've not been listened to. They have been reallocated and redeployed to the front line to deal with COVID. People who have asked for training for years to, to work in ICU who have been denied because of their skin color, because of race discrimination, found themselves having not just been um, alloc um, this, um, allocated um, frontline roles, but also having to learn as quickly as possible um, in those frontline roles to make a difference. And you know, it's just not the issue of COVID. We have the ethnicity pay gap, the racial pay gap, I call it, over 25%. So black workers are earning 75 pence for every pound a white colleague earns. And we also see that, you know, issues of um, 
And in some areas, we know black workers, um, black men in particular, earning four pounds less per hour than their white colleagues. So there are huge economic injustice, huge economic inequality. And we know that unemployment levels, the rates have not changed for the last five decades because black unemployment, and I use black to include all of the BAME groups, um, is running at three times um, that of white unemployment. But we could do a lot more in the trade union movement. And this is where I want unions to be more proactive because we need to um, step up, we need to stand up, and we need to speak up more to protect black workers. But we have the scope and the power of collective bargaining as a powerful tool in the workplace to use. And we need to use it more to make a difference. So we need to start registering the collective grievances on behalf of black workers experiencing discrimination and racism. We need to start um, registering the collective disputes around um, racism in the workplace. You know, black workers should not be having to fight these cases as individuals. We are a collective movement and we need to use the collective power of the law and the collective force of the law to protect black workers. And we need to call out the enforcement regulators who have been found so wanting and have failed in my view in doing the enforcement work that they need to do. We were told this morning um, by prospect that there are more MPs than um, health and safety um, inspectors. And that needs to change. You know, we were told that health and safety um, was red tape. Well, quite frankly, health and safety is not red tape. It's what protects people's lives. And we have seen black workers have paid a huge price out of the 650 um, people working in the NHS, working across the public services, and in the essential services who have died from COVID-19. Um, 72%, yeah, 72%, 72% um, black um, workers. And of the doctors who have died in the NHS um, and care sector, 90% are, are black. And so, you know, it's time for unions to step up, to stand up, to speak up, but also, to use effective judicial oversight to change the law, to bring the cases, you know, the judicial reviews, to bring the test cases, to have these cases in the tribunals and to hold employers to account. Only, um, only three and six, sorry, just to say this, only 60% of employers um, have done health and safety risk assessments. That's not good enough, that has to change. So what I want to see is action, to protect black workers and just to say that black workers have a right under section 441 and section 100 if they feel that they uh, their lives are at risk and their health and safety is at risk they come to their trade union they raise the issue and you know they automatically protected if their lives are at risk so i would say to them don't gamble with your lives don't gamble with your livelihood and your and your family's livelihood um just stand up and, and, and be counted. You've always done so. Come to us and we will make sure that the trade union movement protects your rights fully. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you so much for that and that rallying call. And I didn't really need to tell you to speak up louder because I should know from all of the times I've seen you and been on panels with you before that the passion really comes through. And it, and it, is, um, and it is frustrating to see, you know, to have seen you over the years and have looked up to you, of course, and to see, you know, despite the passion and the number of people on this call that have been working on this issue for so long, that it's come to a point where we've had to see doctor after doctor, nurse after nurse, you know, if you follow Nurses Note on their Twitter, Nurses Notes on their Twitter account, they were like every day releasing photos of nurses that had died. And they were just, you know, it was just black and brown people. Um, and, it, and it just really struck me that it takes that it takes that to really demonstrate not just the commitment of um, ethnic minorities in this country to this country and to our public services, um, but also to wake people up to the levels and consequences of racism in this country. Um, so we're going to come now to uh, Sandra Kerr, who's the director of the Race Equality Campaign at Business in the Community and has been doing work 
on racism in work. Um, and so we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. So I always appreciate my invitations to these uh, events and I am very grateful to the trade union, the likes of uh, Victor, uh, Gloria and others who actually the first Race at Work survey helped us to push out the, the link to get the um, engagement to, to hear firsthand. And, you know, I hope everyone's kind of keeping safe and well, we're in strange times and with what we are, I'm going to quickly talk about is what I've been doing, particularly with employers and also, you know, with demand from them. So first of all, the COVID-19 was flagging the disparities around what's happening with black people, what's happening with um, Asian, uh, the different, all the different ethnic minority groups in the UK so in the back of COVID-19, flagging first that what we learned from 2008 about the disproportionate impact. So I'm not gonna go over the stats that have really, really been well talked about today. I want to share a bit about what I've called the Race at Work Black Voices report. We ran the data from the YouGov survey from 2018 to lift out what black employees were saying about their lived experience in the workplace. And we found that um, only 36% of black employees feel like they're being paid the right, right amount. And this is compared to 42% of other ethnicity groups. Only 56% of black employees believe that they I mean, sorry, 56% of black employees believe they're underpaid compared to 49% of the white ethnicity group. So we've seen already there's disparities. As we move on and we look at things like inclusive leadership, most of you will have heard about this. When we ask the question about, can you be yourself at work? 66% of black employees said yes, compared to 70% of white, Asian and different employees in the workplace. Every time in every, almost every area of this, when we talked about credit for your work, um, are you get given credit for your work? We found that only 49% of black employees said yes, 57% of white employees said yes. So there's disparities around even attribution and getting credit for one's work. And what we found through many of the, uh, the, the, the data on this report, it flags that there is a challenge. And even organizations who have been tackling ethnicity and for a long time can, are now saying honestly that they could say, oh yeah, we've tackled Bain. But when they de-aggregate de the data, those from Black African, Black Caribbean backgrounds are missing and are absent. So it demonstrates that there is work that has to be done to look at that data, track progress, so that if we really do have inclusion, we can hand on our heart, say it's including everyone. We also found when we asked a really important question around, do you think, what do you think will be a career blocker? When it was multiple choice, ethnicity, 33% of black people said they feel like their ethnicity would be a blocker compared to 1% of white people. 33% compared to 1%, huge disparity there. And when you think about what is the lived experience that built um, creates those beliefs, but also what we were pleased to see on the back of what happened with George Floyd and we saw the peaceful anti-racism protests, we saw black and white people out there together saying, no, this is not enough, this is not right, and we cannot have this anymore in a civilized society. And I, going forward, we need, and I have been actively encouraging and promoting allyship. We need those who are in the rooms where the, the, the black voices or brown voices aren't even in the room. We need those leaders to be able to actively be conscious and thinking and speaking up about the need for change. We're calling for um, more conversations because yes, I know people think, oh, well, we've talked and talked, but we need to talk, listen and act together to get change. And what we're calling for is more of these conversations to be convened in within organizations. And we have heard I've, at the, that there, there have been more and more live um, streams, 500, 800 employees on a call with the chief exec at once, talk at the same time, talking through some of these issues and listening to the lived experience with a view to, okay, what are we going to do? We have also seen um, in the last, two months, 170 organizations signed the Race at Work Charter. So prior to the pandemic, it was 250. 
and since the killing of George Floyd and the, the you know it's moved this to the forefront of employers minds and now it's more than 170 additional employers who have signed the race at work uh, charter with a view to commitment to action and that means they're going to have somebody they've got someone at the top table they're committed to capture data and with a view to um, moving forward with ethnicity pay gap reporting it means that they're not going to tolerate bullying and harassment in the workplace and they're going to make sure it gets to the top table it means they want to engage their managers and ensure they also have responsibility for action and also progressing talent because what we also know is the ambition is there, the qualifications are there, the ability is there, and the desire to fast track is there. We know that from the trend data, yet black people are absent from the top tables, be education, business, judiciary, policing, all the key decision-making tables, policy makings in the UK, they are absent. And that needs to change. And then one of the other big trends that have we found around role models, so particularly black people are more likely to look for role models inside and outside the workplace. One of the areas we've called for action is inclusion of black enterprise in the supply chain, so that those who want to um, have their own enterprises and run their own businesses also can get access to opportunity through supplies and connections so that they can actually create um, wealth for themselves. So really just want to re reinforce the cause for action from the black report data is one that we must have ethnicity pay gap reporting implemented because it will shine the light on some of the challenges that we've already heard and bring this discussion to the top table we're calling on employers to actively encourage sponsorship of black talent so leaders to speak for them and then also we're encouraging targets to be set and also inclusion in the supply chain Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Sandra. And it's really interesting to get that perspective and to hear about the results of the various surveys that you guys have done. And um, I mean, none of this will really shock those of us who've you know, been working on racism for some time, but definitely demonstrates that there's a deep problem there. I guess one of the things, and I've heard, um, I've heard many of my friends that work for various different private companies as well, talk about, you know, getting this email and these statements about Black Lives Matter off the back of everything that's happened within, you know, quite white working environments and then feeling as if, you know, this may be just a statement put out with very little action behind it. I guess when we come back to you with questions, one of my questions to you is to how we kind of hold employers to account to make sure that this isn't just a kind of vogue um, issue and then you know, as time moves on, nothing is actually followed up. And I think one of the points you raised there about the data and making sure that people are collecting data, employees are collecting data is certainly part of it. But I know there are um, the, you know, more, the more cynical side of us that thinks, well, yeah, well now they have to say this, but are they really committed? Um, thanks, Sandra. Okay, coming next to Marsha. Marsha, who is the MP of Battersea and is the Shadow Secretary of the State for Equalities um, and Women. What a frustrating, I mean, what an important job, what a frustrating job to have um, <laughs> given the current government's uh, stance um, on, on these issues. Thanks, mm. Marsha. Thank you so much, Faisal. And can I just say hello and thank you to class and to the TUC Black Workers for inviting me to be part of today's panel. And it's great to be sharing a panel with such, a, such esteemed speakers. But before I start, I just want to say I welcome um, the TUC's anti-racism task force, which will investigate some of the systemic discrimination that our black and minority ethnic workers are facing. I thought what Roger was saying was absolutely uh, spot on, that it cannot be a talking shop. It really has to be a task force that leads to concrete actions. Now I'm gonna set my timer because Faisal told me about my timekeeping. But let me just start by saying it's been 43 years since Race Relations Act commenced. Um, however, it gained royal assent last in 76. The act made it unlawful to discriminate on the grounds of race, color, nationality, and ethnic origin. And whilst the act covered areas of education, training, housing, and more importantly, employment, over 40, 40 years on, systemic racism still exists across our society, whether that's in education, where a black child is three times more likely to be excluded from school, 
whether it's in the criminal justice system where black people make up just 3% of the UK population, but 12% of those that are in prison, or whether it's in relation to stop and search, where if you are black, you are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched. Now in relation to our working age adults, we only make up 10% of the workforce. And we know that a greater proportion of our black, Asian and ethnic minority workers are continuously overlooked for promotion in comparison to their white workers and its issues around um, conscious and unconscious bias and discrimination that are all contributing factors. We know where the pay gap stands because Gloria has already alluded to that. But you know, a black worker with a degree will earn almost 23% less than their white counterparts. And I suppose what's been more telling during this coronavirus pandemic is when the Public Health England report beyond the data was produced into the impact of COVID-19 on our black, Asian and minority ethnic communities revealed the real life occupational discrimination and the impact of racism in the workplace. It showed evidence that since the outbreak of that pandemic, there had been a significant number of instances of direct and, ind and indirect discrimination based on ethnicity. And the TUC showed earlier this summer in its report, Dying on the Job, that around one in six black and Asian and minority ethnic workers felt they had been put more at risk of exposure to, grown to coronavirus because of their ethnic background. Now we know, I know that many reports, many have reported of being forced onto the front line, more so than their white colleagues. And I have hosted, chaired many round tables and heard countless testimonies from workers about the discrimination they were experiencing during this pandemic. But what's been more telling and more worrying is that over the past three years, this government have led many reviews into racial inequality and racial injustices and the changes that and many recommendations have been made on some of the changes that need to happen. And a few years ago, it was the Race in the Workplace Review that recommended 26 clear, concise recommendations, mostly targeted at business that focused on publishing um, data, providing transparent career pathways and building inclusive networks. But I think the most significant recommendation was aimed at government in the review and in the the recommendation to actually be calling for mandatory ethnicity pay gap reporting. And yet, even though the government have consulted on this two years later, we still find that we are in a place where nothing has been done. And this matters as reporting on this would actually begin to allow, you know, to highlight some of the disparities that exist within our workplace and would also be a step towards being able to track tackle some of the racial injustices that are taking place. It's not the only thing, but it is obviously a vital tool that would actually help to tackle some of those disparities. And it would also mean that employers will be up for, will have to start to share proper data, but also they will have to start addressing some of the representation and diversity within their leadership teams. Indeed, many organisations have been proactively publishing their data, and I've written to the Prime Minister about this. But we urgently need to see greater representation of our black and ethnic minority uh, people at senior level and at decision-making levels across the board, from our workplaces to education, and also across our trade union movement. And there also needs to be a culture shift within that. Whilst the government also had a golden opportunity to show that it cares by wanting to tackle some of those racial disparities, I don't hold up much hope in the commission that they have set up, which is due to report at the end of this year, because as I've already highlighted, there have been many reports with over 200 recommendations that they could get about implementing and have chosen not to. Racism is systemic and will require systemic solutions. And that is why we, we need a race equality strategy that tackles those racial injustices, that dismantles those institutions and systems where these disparities exist. Whilst you're facing a global racial and health pandemic, the time is for action is now. And at a time when we know that black, Asian and minority ethnic workers have been carrying the greatest burden during this pandemic across our movement, it is time for us to stand up and take action. That is why I welcome the task force. and I look forward to working with the TUC 
to ensure that we can eradicate and eliminate some of those racial injustices that are existing across our society. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Marsha. And I just want to go back to some of the questions that people ask on that government on that government commission, the the latest commission um, uh, post the George Floyd murder was. Let me just read out some of the questions, and this is just how frustrating it is. How much of a blocker to progress the government are being? The questions um, to people that were going to go in person to to speak were. How should we respond to disparities that exist in policy terms? So, I mean, there's been a number of commissions, as Marsha has pointed to, that have told the government already what they need to do in terms of policy terms. Uh, this is the question that really got me. Are, phases like, are phrases like white privilege useful or counterproductive for race relations, particularly in the context of outcomes for white working class people? So a commission that's meant to be on racism specifically one of the three questions is on white people and white privilege and and that it's not helpful and the final question was where and how should society communities individual take responsibility for improve improving outcomes versus the role of the state so i mean it's a very conservative ideology to of course put the emphasis back on the individual um, and say that it's about it's about individual actions or community actions and there's only so much the state can do and so that's I think that for a lot of people hearing those questions those are the questions that the government wants to ask for its commission in dealing with racism it's not just frustrating it just tells us that the sorts of reports and and uh, recommendations that we will hear in uh, by the end of the year will could actually be counterproductive to the anti-racist movement and we have to be ready for that um, so just coming finally to Asad, Asad Rahman, who is the director of War on Want, who is going to give us some reflections. Um, and maybe if, if I can, just to say to people, um, do keep writing your questions in Q&A. Um, there seems to be lots of questions about how we make representation better within the trade union movement. Let's, let's be honest about that at the top. And Gloria, I'll come back to you on that, so be ready. Um, but, but generally questions on kind of practically what we need to do going forward. Um, to come to you, Asad, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, uh, Pfizer and sisters, brothers, comrades, for the opportunity to join so many inspiring sisters here on, on, on this webinar. Um, listening to all the other presentations, I was just reminded of this quote, uh, uh, COVID is exposing fall fallacies and falsehoods everywhere. The lie that free markets can deliver healthcare for all, the fiction that unpaid care work is not work, the delusion that we live in a post racist world, the myth that we are in the same boat. Um, these are not the words of Pfizer, Marsha, or any black trade unionist. Uh, they're the words of the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, in a speech he made last month. And I was struck that these are words that, of course, we will not hear from our own political leaders here in the UK. All of us can see that we live in an already broken world has fractured even further in these last few months. You know, we all know, and it's often said, the corona pandemic has been an X-ray on our societies. It's exposed all the deep racial, social, and economic qualities. Uh, and that might have been news for some, but I think for many of us on this webinar, and particularly for the black community living on the front lines of injustice, it hasn't been news. And of course, that corona pandemic has taken place at the same time as we've seen this explosion of anger as the Black Lives Matter movement has taken to the streets. And we've all been moved by, of course, listening to George Floyd's desperate plea, I can't breathe. But I would argue that that is a call that has echoed throughout the lives of black people and the black community, both in the UK and globally. Not just because it was words that were uttered by Eric Gardner in New York or by Jimmy Mabenga on the runway at Heathrow Airport as he was murdered in 2010. But it's because I think it encapsulates a cry that really spans everything from slavery to colonialism, racialized capitalism, climate, co and today COVID. It's a cry about the injustices that say the lives of some people simply don't matter, that black and brown workers are disposable, are expendable. Uh, but it's also, I think at its heart, also been a call for action that's always connected the struggle in the workplace to the struggle in the community, both at a local, national and global level. And, you know, it's been part of our tradition 
we have been the people who've always collectively argued and connected the struggle for racial justice is nothing without the struggle for economic justice. And as Martin Luther King famously said, those people who don't link economic justice and racial justice, they're offering us installment plans for justice. And of course he was assassinated when he was calling for a poor people's campaign and standing in solidarity with striking black workers. And I think last month, the strike for Black Lives Matter in the UK, which organized low paid black workers was a huge step in reconnecting race and class in understanding that opposing racism isn't just about organizing against the brutality of physical racism in the state, but also about the violence of poverty, because that is no less brutal or racist. And all of the other speakers have spoken so passionately about the connection about racism in the workplace and about poor housing and poverty wages and the precarious contracts, etc. But, you know, it's a tradition that we should always remember it's, it's been part of our legacy here in the UK. It's a tradition that connects the Bristol bus boycotts, the Grunwick strike, the Imperial typewriters, with the struggles not just in the workplace but on our streets. And it always recognised that collective action connects the workplace to our communities. But importantly, we have never all seen this struggle only about just being about the UK. And that's what I want to say, spend a few minutes talking about. We've always connected those struggles in the workplace with solidarity against racism globally. And we've got countless examples of solidarity between black workers here and communities and against and, and with communities around the world, uh, of course, most famously against apartheid, but all through uh, the struggles, whether you see uh, the anti-imperialist struggles in every single continent, black workers here arguing for practical and real solidarity from the trade union and the labor movement. So I think today our call for racial justice has not only to address the permanent crisis faced by the global south, uh, not just from corona or the existing crisis of neoliberal inequality and the global recession that we're saying, or the crisis of climate and justice, but of racism and patriarchy and the legacy of racialized capitalism. Because I think unless we understand that we are talking about a system that has happily been able to sacrifice the poorest, the most disadvantaged black and brown people for the pursuit of simply one thing, of course, the profit of the few. And the one thing that struck me in these last few months is the response to a global pandemic has, has given us an insight as to how the global north will respond to all of these multiple crises. Because what have we seen? We've seen a competition between rich and poor countries for access to health resources. We've seen health and social and economic inequalities in the global south determining survival rates. At the very moment, our own policies on structural adjustment have destroyed the health systems of so many countries in the global south. We've seen countries in the global south paying debt repayments to the to countries like the UK and to the global north at the very same moment as they have le less than one single intensive care bed for their whole po population. And what we've what we've also seen, of course, is black workers in the global south being thrown out on the streets, left destitute as UK businesses shut down their supply chains. And of course, we all saw the pictures of garment workers you know, right across the Indian subcontinent and across the world. As supply chains here shut down, they refused to pay either the wages of their workers there, but they also left them with no protection and are now forcing those same workers back to the works, back to factories on lower paid, on, on, on weaker labour contracts. And of course, while some in the global north were pick, tweeting pictures of pictures of ducks and bears and deer in their cities and say nature is recovering. We had migrant workers in the global south walking thousands of kilometers, uh, trying to get back home and often dying on the way. And we of course were struck by the pictures of Ecuador where the dead were, laid, were left unburied at the very same moment as Ecuador was paying debt repayments back to the global north and was being applauded by the IMF and the World Bank. And of course the worst is yet to come. I'm told, Am I, have I already got to five minutes? Oh my God. All right. Uh, can I just, I'll just end on one, on, on, on one last sentence. Look, in our struggle against racism, we have to be global in nature. We have to be able to connect economic, social, and political. At the very formula foundation of the creation of the labor movement, you know, the, its purpose was always seen as global. Across every union banner stands the slogan, workers of the world unite, not workers of England, not white workers. And I think we have to remind people 
that being part of the labour movement and being part of the struggle against racial injustice is not simply about standing here in the UK. It's about reimagining our internationalism, reimagining our solidarity and standing with workers all around the world and holding our own government and our own corporations accountable for their actions. Thank you. Thank you, Asad, and thank you all for those really inspirational speeches. And I think, um, you know, really highlighting the issues. I think one of the things that's coming out on the many comments that's coming through on Q&A, apart from um, the thanks from, from participants, is what are kind of real life practical examples, not just of the in the past, but right now of where um, people are organizing, um, where people are organizing within the workplace and winning, where businesses for you, Sandra, are taking action, moving beyond just asking the question and listening and just thinking about what they do next. And um, for you, Asad, for instance, what kind of international solidarity between workers, if there are specific ex examples of where that's happening. I'm just going to read out a few questions. I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about that because I know it's always hard, but we can talk about these terms sometimes and these um, the importance of things like solidarity um, and, and organizing, but to kind of really give people a, a real um, idea of what that looks like in practice. So I'm going to ask you to, to name some examples of that, just to give us some inspiration in that respect. Um, I am going to just pick out some questions. There's someone, Mark from CW, emailed me earlier um, about a question really about how to deal with racism, given that so many people have different ideas about what racism is, that we are still in a situation where people don't always understand um, the way in which microaggressions might play out, for instance, um, and um, how it works through the system, through employment, etc. cetera. Um, how do we get, and this question, as I mentioned before, how do we get more black people into senior union and management roles? Um, I was quizzed on this recently um, and, and you know, looked at a picture of all of the general secretaries of trade unions and it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a good look. Um, and certainly I think we have to think about how we are building pipelines to the tops of all kinds of organizations in particular around um, the black working class, black working class people who are not represented. Um, let me read out a couple more questions before I come back to you. Um, so one, so there are some people that have posted where they've spoken about their own um, uh, examples and experiences of racism. Um, so someone here, Simon, has asked, be interested to hear your views on um, why, why it is that people don't come forward about their experiences of racism and why they don't really, why they don't always report it. That might be something for you, Gloria. Um, but you know what's going on there? People have people just accepted it, um, and they're not speaking out about it. Um, this is, I guess, a question again. To I know that um, Patrick isn't on the call, but maybe Gloria, you could pick this up on um, from Pauline. How do you plan to integrate Black Lives Matters and the anti-EU um, workers' racism into a structured TUC campaign? Um, it might be something that you guys have been thinking about at Unison. Um, and that is really about building solidarity there. Um, let me just get one more. Um, uh, sorry, there's so many, it's really good to see so much engagement. Um, okay, someone, one from Sharon Clark. What do you think could be done to make institutions accountable for racist incidents? I'm a black female working as a lecturer um, and also a union rep. So, you know, we know within the university sector, and I've heard this time and time again, it's meant to be one of our most enlightened spaces, but there are all kinds of issues of racism and sexism, and we see that by the, the lack of black lecturers. Um, but when um, speaking to people at UCU and Jay Grady is that when um, black lecturers and staff try and complain, there's not much that's really done. So what can we do to really hold institutions to account? Um, I'm going to start with you, Gloria, if you want to come back on some of that. And any practical examples, examples recently of organizing that have inspired you that you think we should know about? Yeah, well, first of all, can I just say, I've just had to fill in a, a survey for the Labour Research Department, um, looking at um, what trade unions are doing for Black workers in terms of, you know, where people are represented. 
And I must say, you know, unison, um, um, over well, two um, decades ago, we introduced what was a trainee officer program. We also introduced um, some action plans based on the Stephen Lawrence task force um, um, from the TUC. And, you know, 20% of our senior managers and 20% of our regional organizers uh, are black. Um, I just, um, and seven out of the 68, 16%, I think it was, um, I, I found that um, I calculated were on the NEC, including four reserve seats. But the, the point I want to make is, you know, we need to, you know, we need to get real. The first question I ask employers, one employer phoned me up and said, oh, Ms. Smith, what, could, what should we be doing? What do you think of our organization? I said, quite frankly, you're a closed organization. And the first thing I would ask is how black is your organization? I'm not asking you for the, about 100% of agency cleaners who come in every day. I want to know how black is your organization. And he really bought, he said, you know, no one has ever asked me that. I said, well, I'm asking you that because, you know, you can't, I'm not going to engage with you on race if you cannot tell me how black is your organization. And I think we really do need to ask those really good, important questions, because if we don't ask those questions, we are really not serious in dealing with this issue in terms of integrating our action plan for change in terms of Black Lives Matter. So we need to change the agenda. I've always argued that. We need to change the culture and we need to change the structure. And it's really important. Someone said, well, why do Black people don't speak up? Well, I always say, you know what? You know, I was brought up um, that, you know, you um, being Black is not your disadvantage. Being a woman is not your disadvantage. It's other people's problem, not yours. And, you know, so what happens is if you're treated differently and, you know, it's because of your gender or because of your race, well, you know what I would say to people, just document it and take it up. It's difference in treatment. It's not a needle in a haystack. You know, if one, if you ask your manager um, for something and you are black and then the manager, and that's the rule, and the manager says, well, no, um, I'm not applying the rule because I think it's my discretion. Where there's discretion, there's discrimination. So if you give it to a white person and you fail to give it to a black person and you exercise your discretion in a discriminatory way um, and you don't follow the procedures and the rules, then that's discrimination. So I think it's really important that we do a lot more in um, pointing out, and we've got a, Unison's got a lot of publication in terms of how you spot the difference in terms of racial treatment. And I think it's really important now because people would be doing redundancy. They will be doing restructuring. They'd be going in, you know, it's last in, first out. And the worst thing that could happen, and I tell you, call it out, it's racism. If you have an um, organization with 7,000 people and you restructure and you make redundant, the only black person in that organization, because you do a pool of one, then that's racism. The pool is the whole organization. You don't pick the only black person in the organization. And I would say, I'd refer you to a case, Chagas versus um, Abbey National. He got 2.7 million pounds for being selected at 41, age 41, in a pool of one. So I say, these are some of the issues that we need to be looking at. So we need to begin to redress the racial imbalance. Um, and, and, and in a number of areas, we need to start with a race audit and the race audit has got to be about asking how black is your organization, that's important. We need to look at positive action in a number of areas and there are also positive discrimination if people are equally qualified for a job and the organization is 100% white, then you can actually um, employ someone who is a different color if you have underrepresentation. It's about employing people on the basis of merit who are equally qualified. So we need to deal with these issues. But we also need to have, I believe, a race equality commission that is going to take action on race. You know, we have gone back um, over the last four decades because race has not been featured on the radar of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. It has fallen off the radar. Um, and um, what has happened is we are now seeing some of the worst um, examples 
of how workplace racism is playing out, but also the wider issue of work of racism in society. A lot of employers are not doing the statutory um, risk assessments that they should be doing. They were told by NHS England in April to do that, and they are not doing that. And no one is holding them to account. And I just hope that you know people at the workplace level would begin to say, our employer have not done these risk assessments and from a trade, registered a trade union grievance on behalf of groups of employees, disabled women, pregnant workers, whichever groups um, are being um, discriminated against, and also register the collective disputes and con contact your union lawyers, you know, to bring the cases that are necessary. So it's great. Yeah. Uh, to interrupt, Gloria, there was a question that someone asked as well about we've spoken about the frustration about the lack of action government wants to take and um, is willing to take and, and various um, ways in which they are, they are undermining action on this issue. Someone asked, is it time to move away from engaging with government um, and with these task, for, task force and to focus much more on direct action? I'm gonna, Marsha, I'm gonna come and get you to answer this as well, but. I'm just wondering, Gloria, if you've got any thoughts on that just quickly. Well, you know, as someone who spent my life with direct action outside, you know, a lot of the banks and a lot of the supermarkets um, to stop apartheid in this country, but also who have always believed in direct action, direct action have a place to play. Um, and not only that, you know, deciding where you spend your money. I mean, a lot of us spent a lot of time saying to the banks, if you were not going to employ black workers, um, in those positions, then we won't be spending our money with you. That's what we did in the 70s. That's what we did in the 80s. And direct action, and, you know, the power of the black and the brown pound, you know, we've got to make sure that it's actually leveraged um, in terms of our political power as well. You don't give your votes for free either. You know, you have to begin to leverage, you know, all of these issues in order to make the changes and the gains that you want. That's what we see in corporate, the capitalism. That's how they operate. They spend more time lobbying governments and getting their views in there um, before um, you know, the public gets their views. So we need to start putting the public interest first. And that means that in a lot of areas like this, what we need to do, we need to recognize that you know, there are powerful roles that can be played. I always say direct action. I do not like violence, no violence as far as I'm concerned, but you know, make the power um, of your pound and the power of your vote um, count in a, in, a, in a very important way. So these are important issues that we need to deal with. And I, want, and I just want to say, it's you know, people's power that will bring about the change. We've seen how the, the you know, people's conscience across the world were disturbed by what they saw about the George Floyd murder. You know, people's conscience were disturbed. They could not sit back and not do anything to have such systematic human rights abuse of black people without any judicial oversight, without governments being called to account. It's an absolute disgrace. And we should be ashamed of saying we respect law and order. We respect democracy. When we have people wearing a badge of state think that they have got a right, you know, and a license to, ex to, to execute black people. That is not their job. That is the job of the judiciary. And we must have judicial oversight in this. We've got to change that culture. It's totally unacceptable. It's totally abhorrent, totally representable, um, reprehensible that black people, you know, have to think twice about where they, where they go, what they do. And you know, the systematic everyday racism we are facing, you go to the bank, you have to prove who you are. You know, I had to get some money the last time and they asked me, you know, um, you know for to bring my um, birth certificate, passport and everything. I said, I tell you what, I'll see you in court. I got the money straight away. I'm not, you don't play those games and, and you don't engage with organizations who have no intention of making any real change in terms of um, race equality. Lots of organization have asked me to join their task force, to join this, that, and the other. I am abandoning them. I will not engage with them. I am not engaging with racism in any form. If you are not serious about racism, do not ask me to participate in any of your working groups, your working parties. I will have no truck with it. And that's my views on it.
Thanks, Gloria. I mean, yeah, I mean, what can I say? I, I, I agree and I understand. And I think one of the things that really strikes me most about watching everything that's happened in the last few months is how tired and fed up in particular the black community is of course and um how just how much this weighs on people emotionally um it just it is very frustrating that things have are still yet to change in various different ways it just before i bring you in sandra I just there's a couple of questions that were more specifically to you one is um what is the best process to get our employers to engage and sign the race at work charter. So if you could just explain how people could do that. Um, and one more, I can find it, yeah. Um, from Liz Baptiste is, Elizabeth Baptiste is, um, that you talk about inclusion. This should be seen not as a policy or process, but a behavior embraced by everyone working in the organization. Um, what advice do you and the other people in the planet panel have to suggest to take that forward? Because yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's not just about policies, just a, it's a mind change, really a mindset change. Thanks. Sandra. Okay, so thank you. So um, I think firstly, uh, how do you get employers to sign a race at work charter? You send them the Black Voices report. It's lots of insight and data and for them to look at. And I set out in the forward what to actually do with the report. I say, send it to the chief exec, send it to the HR director send it if you have a sponsor executive sponsor for race send it to them and say can we have a look at this have we had a look at this in this organization can we start to check if these disparities are uh, a similar experience in our organizations because it is a yougov survey you're going to find that yes it is they're going to find it does correlate and you can use it to start to have the conversations some practical things i think all employers should be looking at their data representation. So we talked about that, the importance of capturing the data can't be overemphasized. So you can actually look at the evidence and see. I mean, I know sometimes in the senior teams, you can look around the room and see there's no black or brown people there. But what I'm saying, look at the data and have that, encourage that to be captured and where it is, can we get that surfaced so that it can be scrutinized? The second thing, I would say is many most organizations are doing some kind of or have done some kind of inclusive leadership training with leaders saying yes we want everyone to feel included and what you do you surface the survey survey data to check is everybody feeling like they belong is everybody feeling like they're included in the organization because you will find disparities you will find gaps and then the action can be how can we close that gap so that no matter who we are in this organization everyone's feeling that sense of belonging because that's really important you know they talk about it's one thing to get in the room but it's another thing to actually be treated well when you're there and be have your contributions respected and your voice heard so really a very important part of this um this, this the the third thing i've got here is about access to projects and stretch opportunities and good work really really important when you're building pipeline that people get access to the opportunities that are often talked about in the leadership rooms where the, the, you're not you know where many workers are not but these these opportunities are really important and the leaders need objectives to ensure that they are distributing those across the piece so that all workers can get opportunities to do good work particularly um, as employers are looking at downsizing or creating new roles, um, particularly sometimes in the light of this pandemic, lots of new roles unforeseen have been uh, created and it's about ensuring fair access to those roles and actually making it a requirement, particularly in government as a policymaker, to have due regard to the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 in any future policymaking. Also, I think um, monitoring, so I've got monitoring here and progress and setting targets for improvement. And I think the equality impact of assessment is never been more important to ensure that when you are downsizing or thinking about those things, you are checking first, assessing first to ensure that you're not just slashing bits of the workforce and cutting the jobs of all your black or Asian people. Or you're just cutting all the women or whatever without looking. So really, really important that that is assessed before those decisions are taken and the impact of that to think about can you deploy people to different areas and then also including diversity so diverse people black and asian people wherever possible on every every part of the selection process because the evidence is clear 
when you have that diversity throughout that process, the outcomes are better for more diverse hires, be it either recruitment or progression. So really important now as we're moving into those times. And then I touched on at the beginning around there's a work for employers to do, particularly those who the government fund through the taxpayers' um, contribution, strategic compliance, to ensure that a percentage of that supply chain funding goes to um, entrepreneurs, social uh, uh, enterprise, and any organization that is linked to Black and Asian communities. So I think there's a huge piece linked to social value contribution to ensure that some of that funding and some of those contract opportunities are going to those uh, communities. So those are just some of the things that I think um, need to be moved and, and employers are moving on these um, actions in different ways and I think action plans that actually you know put forward what steps are we going to take to achieve this is really important so not just the the big statements which you were saying at the beginning phase of people saying oh you know this really matters but where's the plan underneath with the steps then so we're going to have change so tell me the step by step because that's often what is missing and, and I guess, I'll see more of that happening and I guess once you forced your employer to have that sort of list then and um, all those uh, those aims and actions then it's easier to hold them to account with absolutely i mean it's absolutely if it's public it's great you've got something now which to start to to, to yeah. make sure that it, it it you know is not just words but actually delivers some results i guess one thing just coming back to liz's question just those are all policy and practical actions do you see that ultimately changing values and mindset or is there other things that we have to do because equality has been an afterthought for so long um, and you know could go back to being an afterthought really or for some people already you know, with the George Floyd stuff and the less Instagram um, pictures and um, Facebook posts um, reminding them of the importance of Black Lives Matter they might you know they will slip back into old ways of thinking, how do we really make that permanent change? I think the stories, the the um, the employee survey, the lived experience, people telling the story about what is going on in that workplace, um, senior leadership uh, te teams, they need to be, one of the things I've seen, some, I'm encouraging every employer to do is surface those comments, bring them to the top table, anonymize them, whatever, but make them clear that this is, these are the voices of people talking in your organization. These, and one of the things I saw one employer do, which is quite clever, is you know, the microaggressions, the things about that are said, that they actually got white employees to read some of it out. And that's how you saw how weird some of these comments are that are said to people, but it really had an impact. So really surfacing the comments and quotes that have come out of the teams in their organizations. And most employers do have horrible things in the employee survey. Surface that to the top team, let them hear the voices of people in their organizations, because the evidence is in that, that is, it gives everyone a jolt and it stops everyone thinking, oh, everyone else has the problem to bring some ownership inside that organization for action. That's really helpful. Thanks, Sandra. And I did hear about some of that happening from friends in different workplaces where their colleagues were like surprised by their experiences of racism and just how yes. they think. Yes. Um, especially for black male friends. Um, yes. So just, just because we're going to wind up now, I guess we lost Marsha because I knew she, well, she, I think she had to leave a little bit earlier. Um, I said, I'm going to come to you, but I think one of the things that um, to come back to kind of some practical examples of what we can look at where that organizing that solidarity across borders is happening. Well, I, I think a very powerful example definitely was the strike for Black Lives Matter. Uh, it was, I mean, it's an initiative that ha was came out of both the Poor People's Campaign which tried to, which has been trying to reimagine that Martin Luther's King campaign for this moment, reconnecting the demands around racial justice to economic and social around pay, but also about health and education and housing. Um, but it also relied on, you know, the unions like the SEIU investing in it, recognizing that it needed new forms of organizing, that the labor movement needs to invest in organizing and supporting community organizing in the communities as well. And I think there's a, that was quite impressive, both in the US, the amount of actions that took place. 
but it also had a beginning of a solidarity here in the UK. Of course, not on the same scale, because here with the Bakers Union and the McStrikers and trying to organise particularly low paid black workers and people in precarious work conditions, as you, all of your chat says, you know, that's a very, very difficult because workers feel really isolated. They feel like they don't have power. They feel that if they do complain, they're on zero hour contracts, they could be let go. Uh, and we all know this is all part of the rolling back of labour rights that we've seen. So to re-strengthen those and to rebuild confidence, nothing builds confidence as much as collective action and working together. So I think that's a very, very good example. Look, when we saw earlier this month, or a couple of months ago, when we look at Leicester with the garment workers in Leicester and, in, and, and being paid, you know, £2, £3, £3.50 an hour, you know, one of the things that we've been doing as War on Want is, of course, been trying to organise garment workers, but also through the supply chains. And to recognise that the only way we're going to be able to fight this is not to be able to fight it simply like uh, workers in the shops, separate from workers in making the products. And a lot of unions are recognising that this now. So if you look at the work around Amazon and around garment workers, there's incredible cross-national solidarity being built where people are demanding not as an or, so they don't make the international demand as an or, they make it as an and. They say, we want fair pay here in whatever the national context is, and we want fair pay for black workers in, in the supply chain. And they start to call for that through the, through the supply chain and then use their power in global North countries to expose the countries. I mean, it's happening with Next, it's happening with quite a few different companies. Look, you know, this is all part of, as, as everybody said, a systemic issue. The fact that, what uh, you know, we've got about, what, less than a thousand health and safety inspectors, uh, 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 frontline health and safety inspectors, which has gone down from uh, uh, halved in the last decade, yet we've got tens of thousands immigration enforcement inspectors. It says about a lot about where the state wants to invest resources, how it wants to see the deregulated economy and who falls under the, under the, you know, that becomes the underclass. We've seen the reality and we know that that's the agenda to move forward. That's what I think, you know, this is part of a much bigger conversation for the labor movement as a whole, that if it wants to rebuild power, if it wants to rebuild strength, actually for its own sake, it needs to start organizing explicitly much stronger with black workers, particularly in precarious work conditions and much stronger against racism. I mean, the fact that hundreds of thousands of people in the UK marched on Black Lives Matter but yet when black workers go out on strike, there's hardly any solidarity with them. Shows that we've not done a good job to connect the economic and social justice. But the possibility is there. And I think that's where all of us are around here. We all do that on our day to day. But it really needs more than just our individual pieces of work. I think it really needs the labour movement as a whole, both politically and the trade union movement, to say that this is something it needs to do. And that does require not just a vision, but it needs to be able to articulate political demands that connect all of these issues. I think one of the problems we've got is often we have so many different demands, but they aren't connected together and they don't then become sound like a coherent political program to address a systemic issue. And it is a systemic issue. And we all know that one policy isn't going to solve it, but often that's what exactly what we're told. And uh, we see more and more companies now doing you know, in diversity and inclusion statements. We saw them all doing their black squares about Black Lives Matter. At the same time, you know, Rio Tinto was doing that and at the same time was, you know, blowing up Aboriginal uh, ancestral sites that predate Ice Age, right? I mean, it was like incredible how these companies can dis disassemble these particular issues in terms of PR in the global north and carry on destructive practices. That does require the labor movement, I think, to think outside of the workplace. And yeah. I would say it's, there's, there is an amazing work that is happening. It's happening across many of the different unions that are at the TUC, but I think it really needs to be more resourced if we want to be, if we want to be as effective as, as we can be. Great, thank you, Asad. I'm just, we're gonna close up now and I just wanted to give you each, just a very short period of time, just two minutes to answer this and I'm gonna be really strict on time. And um, I just want to, a couple of comments that have just been made that I think need reading out but for us to think about. And one is on the issue of intersectionality. Someone here called Tracy has written that um, they get double dis disadvantage for black women um, uh, and there's very little around race and disability. It's a shame Marsha's not on the call anymore. 
Um, as a partially deaf woman, I would like more looked at regarding this. So um, it was important to keep in mind the intersectional issues. But this really struck out, struck me, and I, you know, it's quite a sad statement, but I think it's something that we do really need to engage with, especially given, you know, how tired so many people amongst the movement are, because these things aren't just um, separate to who we are. They're not just our day jobs. This is part of everything we stand for and our identities. So someone here has written, um, I've been working for close to 25 years, nothing has changed and nothing will. The same issues are discussed each time there is a racist murder, outright, outrage, um, and then back to the norm. What, what do you say to disillusioned people like me? Um, I want change, but you know, obviously this person is still engaging, they're still here today. What do we say to people that just are, tired and fed up and feel like they've been fighting for a long time and have been on the you know on the sharp end of racism for so many years i know this is a big question but i think it's a, an, an important thing to acknowledge um i'll start i'll just start by saying something because i can tell you all thinking about it um i mean i guess one of the things that i find strength in and strength from is really coming together and knowing that you're alone and um, being in forums like this, hearing from Gloria, hearing from Marsha, hearing from Sandra and Asad um, and realizing there are things we can do. And the thing that it keeps coming back to for me, and I say this as someone that comes from a more researchy background is the importance of organizing and organizing in our communities of having the conversation and, and through that building um, a strength in that community that wants change and finding um, love and su support in that way. And that does take work, that does take action, that doesn't just happen from sitting at home. But those are the ways um, that I've been trying to kind of push through what is a very, very difficult time for various reasons. And um, Sandra, do you want to comment on that? What would you say to, to Raj? I would say this is like the, <laughs> the world peace question, you know, the big one around what do we do to kind of get change? And I think one of the, th the ways is, as I say, I'm into get the numbers, get the evidence to highlight that there is a challenge, but also the stories. So people sharing the stories of the impact of racism, of discrimination, um, of COVID-19, whatever the challenges are, um, it's time for everybody to speak up. And even those, I know people are tired and sometimes they think, oh, I just can't, I don't want to, I can't be, you know, I just exhausted, I just rather put my head down and keep going. But if ever there's a time for people to speak up and, and that's why I'm actively pushing and encouraging actually employers to have more conversations because you've got to, now it's time to listen and hear the lived experience. And it's important that um, when both black and white people come to the table. So I'm going to share that stat again. I talked about a potential career block blocker, 33% of black people thinking that's going to be a blocker compared to 1% of white people. So there's a huge lived experience difference and it's about acknowledging that and coming to the conversation, to, to the table, to listen, to understand, not with skepticism, but actually saying, let's, a curiosity to say, let's put our heads together and try and tackle these issues. So I think the stories and people telling people about their lived experience, I think we are in a time where people are, their ears are a bit more active, you know, listening opposed to being dismissive. dismissive. And although we can focus on the few that don't want to make change, why don't we work with the ones that do? So uh, that's what I would say. Thanks, Sandra. Gloria, a couple of minutes, sorry to keep it short. Oh. You're still muted, one sec. There you go, thanks Gloria. Am I unmuted now? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Okay, just to say on the issue of intersectionality, it's a key feature of everything we do in unison. It's built into at the outset, so, and we approach everything from an intersectional lens. So it's a very important point and, and we will ensure that um, more people are aware of it because we are very diverse and it's important that we have an intersectional approach to things. Um, but I, I think in, in terms of um, what Raj was saying about, um, you know, it's the same, you, sometimes you PBS, you, go, you know, <laughs> you're going through the same uh, motions and it's the same brick walls you were coming up against. And I think sometimes you have to 
um, learn how to overcome those brick walls. You know, the challenges are um, formidable, but for me, they're never insurmountable. So you need to be the change you want to see. And that means you've got to start organizing and forming the groups, the collective groups that will challenge these issues. So you, um, I think um, we don't have the luxury of being fed up, of being tired and being disillusioned. You know, I think uh, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King said it, you know, um, if you stop speaking out and organize and you know the, the end is nigh. And I think it's really important that, you know, um, we rejuvenate ourselves, we refresh ourselves um, to redress these injustices. They're not going to go away. They are going to face not just our generation, our children's generation, our grandchildren's generation. Is that the legacy we want to leave for them? No, I do not want to leave that legacy for them. We must be the change and be the change now. And we must have that urgency to force the pace of change and to make sure we make that difference now. History is not what you read about. History is the change you create every day in challenging all of these injustices, standing up and being counted, stepping up, and also holding others to account. We need to hold others to account. Um, there are lots of areas we can hold the government to account by forcing them to do the public sector equality audits, the risk assessments, and all of these things that um, the HSC has powers to do. We could actually, um, as I was saying, you know, bring those legal challenges on um, on judicial review, you know, it's cheaper to bring a judicial review um, as, a, as, a, as a member of the public or as an employee rather than as an organization. You could go down to, you could go on the internet and write out your own case and bring your employers to account. You don't have to wait to pay an expensive lawyer, but also lawyers are doing it pro bono as well. So please start taking action, start organizing, mobilizing, and please never become disillusioned. The day you become disillusioned, you know that's the end. And I am not at the end. I will continue to fight with every bone and every fiber I have and to make and to ensure that um, people are held to account for their racism and for the systemic racial abuse, degradation and um, of black people and also the systematic abuse of black people's lives. And some of these things we should be looking at whether we could take them to the European Court of Justice and Human Rights. We know that's why the government wants to get out of all those legal obligations. And we also need to make sure that we bring them to the, 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 the in, um, International Court of The Hague to account for the systematic racial abuse and deaths of black people that has been going on for over four centuries. It's not on, and we need to find new ways to challenge it and to make these people accountable. Thank you, Gloria. We so needed that rightly in Rod of, um, to remind us of how important this is and how we don't have a choice. And in fact, if we get depressed and give up, that means they've won. It really does. And that's what stays with me. And um, you know, obviously people on this call will know that I fought Ian Duncan Smith and lost and that is what stays with me. You know, you don't just give up. I'm not gonna give the right and the racist and the rest of them the ultimate win. That's just not gonna happen. And that's what we have to go back to. And it can be hard at times, but reach out to people and keep going. Asda, I'm gonna give you the last word. So um, I think those of us with, who are a bit old, I probably feel that at times, but you know, I remember when my father worked in the knitting factories and was sacked along with black workers without any support of the trade union movement. I remember a time when, you know, white workers, organized white workers were marching for the far right, where the far right were at workplaces. I, I, my, I spent my formative years working around racial violence and police violence on, on the streets. Uh, you know, the, 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 we, we heard about Stephen Lawrence, right? That, that call about institutional racism was, you know, was decades of demands by the black community of organizing the amount of racist murders that we had. You know, our campaigns in the 70s and 80s were simply about the right to live free from attack as we walk down the street. We have achieved a lot, and that has been because we've organized and we've struggled and we've had those victories. Yeah, it's we, we, we're not far, we're not, you know, where we want to be, absolutely, and as glory. So we're talking about 500 years of systemic oppression built into our system. We're not going to overturn that overnight but we have had incredible victories and particularly in the labor movement. When we look at, for example, things like Grunwick, 
You know, the idea that the white working class organized labor would rally in support of black workers, of migrant workers, and recognize that this was an economic and a class struggle, that did more, and that was a huge victory. The fact that we've got people like Gloria and Roger, that we had Bill Morris, that the trade union movement did stand, start to stand again with the black community around racist violence and provide support to, to families fighting around deaths in custody and racism was a huge step forward. Of course it is, but now we're on the most difficult part, which is about institutional racism, which we always knew was much harder to unravel. And that requires a multifaceted approach and different stra strands. But there is so much to be hopeful for. There is so much that I'm hopeful when I see the amount of young people out on the streets on Black Lives Matter. I'm hopeful when I see the fact that people now recognize that we have an intersectional crisis. They don't see, say, I'm fighting racism over there and I'm fighting climate over here, or I'm fighting inequality over there, or I'm fighting this. They, they are coming, they're drawing the links that we always said that was at the heart of black struggle, race, class, gender, internationalism. We always connected those struggles. It was other movements that said these issues are all separate. And now is the time for all those to create the movement of movements, to have political vision, to be radical, to have transformational demands. I think one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years with neoliberalism, it took away people's imagination to believe that anything different was possible. And now slowly people are recognizing there has to be an alternative to the crisis that we see. And this is the moment for all of us to strike and say, we don't want the bottom. We have to be striking higher and higher, raising the bar, making those transformational demands and building the power. Ultimately, it's never about what we demand. It's about whether we've got the organizing power to make those demands come true. And that's why we always, all of us, everybody should be con convincing people to join the trade union movement because that is still the biggest organizing section of, of working people. But we must also rebuild our community organizations because that combination between labor movement in the workplace and community organizations, our communities, it's so powerful. And then I think we have a chance to actually transform not just this country, but globally. And, you know, this is a life or death choice. I don't think it's a question that any of us can walk away because we have always understood when the moment we get involved in this struggle, we're not just fighting for ourselves or for our families or our communities, we're fighting for on the shoulders of giants from past generations, but we are literally fighting for who will survive in these coming de decades. How many people will be sacrificed at the altar of economic and racial injustice? And that's the that's what has to keep our fire burning. You know, you look at now the icons of Angela Davis. We look at all of those people, and we say it's incredible. They went through such repression but they still stay strong and they're still talking about mobilizing people. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to inspire, we've got to educate, we've got to organize. Great, thank you Asad and thank you all for that. And it, and it is life and life or death and that's what we're fighting for now. And I think um, we will at class continue to organize and bring people together and hope to do that in person soon as well um, and build that community. Um, and to thank, I, mean, I just wanna thank all of the speakers who've given their time and energy um, on this issue today, which is really at the heart of so many of our problems and the injustice that we see, not just here, but globally. Um, and yeah, to thank uh, TUC Black members for doing this with class um, and just to say, keep in touch to everyone that has joined us. So many people that have joined 